This is RNZ National. It's uh, coming up for 10.32. And now, well, it's time for Midweek Media Watch um, with Hayden Donnell. So you wanted to start with the major international news of the day, Donald Trump being arrested, Hayden. Yes, Mark, kia ora. Uh, relatively significant news. Uh, this is how the moment played out on CNN. And they are pulling up here now to the door. Can you guys stand back? And we see uh, several of the SUVs here, Anderson, pulling up to the corner. And the former president, Donald Trump, is about to step out of this SUV and enter the Manhattan DA's office, where he will be placed under arrest. Now, that was accompanied by drone footage. Uh, I guess they closed off a street or something of Trump exiting a car, entering that DA's office in Manhattan, getting arrested. There's certainly been a bit of criticism of how this coverage played out, hasn't it? Yes, not that bit in particular, but the lead up to that moment. So the TV media outlet spent an age, this is in America, like maybe 24 hours covering Trump's plane commute from Florida to New York. They filmed the plane on for lengthy stretches of time while it was stationary on the runway tarmac, and the action was pretty slow. So at one point, on-air talking heads were actually monitoring the progress of his luggage. The luggage is starting to come out <laughs> from the bottom. So my, my guess is that they don't want to get off the plane until the luggage is in the cars. That way they can just come down the stairs and then be ready to go. So um, we're just kind of watching this. We've all waited for our luggage at airports, and that's kind of what we're seeing play out right now. Scintillating stuff, live TV there. Uh, the allegation from some of these commentators was that the media on this story was basically repeating the mistakes it made in the past, where it helped create a cult of personality around Donald Trump in 2015 and 2016 by delivering this kind of unfiltered, unmediated, uh, absolutely overwhelming coverage of his every move, no matter how mundane. So what do you think of that? I mean, is that fair? The criticisms? Um, I do. I get that concern. And we've, we've had these instances where CNN, Fox, other outlets, they literally carried live footage of an empty podium at, at the front of a rally saying that they were, and this is live footage, that they're waiting for Trump to speak at one of these rallies. So here's Fox's Brett Beyer actually talking about that in reference to today and yesterday's coverage, expressing some of his concerns. We saw this ahead of the 2016 uh, election as well, uh, and that was we said that the that then businessman Donald Trump was going to be talking and and we put up uh, and we're guilty of it as well uh, you know empty podiums waiting for uh, him to get to the podium this now coverage of this is really uh, quite something to watch I think he's trying to dance around a bit of a delicate point there about Fox News his own network but uh, yeah, it's, it's, they're saying that they're doing the same thing again. And Mary Trump, Trump's niece, one of his prominent critics, said basically the same thing on Twitter. She said, you know, the media's insistence on covering every aspect of this man's life to the exclusion of all else is one of the reasons this country is in such dire straits. And I can understand that. But on the other hand, this it's not every day that a former US president gets arrested for allegedly paying hush money to a sex worker. This is major news. It's uh, not just a campaign rally. It's not like filming an empty podium uh, at a small campaign stop in Iowa or something like that, New Hampshire. Uh, you know, this this is something that really actually deserves a bit of attention. And there's also the fact that the empty podium shots they arguably weren't the main problem. It was pretty weird seeing an empty podium, but they weren't the main problem with the media's Trump coverage. And the greater concern was how TV news outlets in particular would just carry his speeches live without any fact-checking. And the issue with that, of course, was that he would say a whole bunch of lies, distortions, and half-truths. And by the time fact-checkers could even, you know, get their socks on, they'd flown halfway around the world on social media and the magosphere, media sphere. Um, it, it's... That's really the issue, the, the carrying of the speech is live, and so r rather than just the attention itself. And it's worth noting on that front that at least NPR, the National Public Radio Service in the US, it did refuse to cover Trump speaking live today, and it did affirm its commitment to covering other news. So maybe there is a little bit of learning taking place in the US media, if, even if it hasn't learned every lesson. 
Well, speaking of the media's performance, uh, you wanted to briefly note that the results of a new survey, and this is on trust in the media, and it's just come out this week. Uh, what were the key findings? Yeah, forgive me if I sound like a stuck record or you're getting deja vu here, uh, but trust in the media is down. I feel like I say that every year, and that's because I do say that every year. So in 2023, 42% of people said they trusted the New Zealand media. That figure has declined every year for the four years that the survey has been running, uh, uh, has been run by the Journalism, Media and Democracy Centre at uh, AUT. And so in 2020, it was actually above 50%. 53% of New Zealanders trusted news in general. That dropped to 48% in 2021 and 45% in 2022, and again further this year. So what are the reasons for that decline? So in the words of one of the study's authors, that's complex and not fully understood. And they've got a whole bunch of theories on it and responses from the, the survey respondents. But one of them is obviously just the huge, what, what you talked about with Anjum just now. I mean, the, the huge amount of discourse on social media aimed at undermining people's trust in society's institutions, including the media. And that crusade has been particularly intense in the last few years with the rise of anti-vax belief and the adherence of that have now spread into other online subcultures, including the anti-trans movement. And, but uh, it can't maybe just be that, because on the other hand, only 14% of the people surveyed <laughs> said that they actually trust the information they get on social media here. So they actually said that the, they said some other reasons for the decline in trust. They were cited by persistent participants and they include that the news is biased they think or that media organizations aren't transparent or even that reporting is full of grammatical errors i don't know if that's something that bugs you mark but i mean uh, one thing i found interesting 61 percent of people who didn't trust the news said that they they didn't trust it because of government support for the media they didn't think that the media could be independent but that clashes with Another finding from the same survey, TVNZ and RNZ are still the most trusted news brands. And I don't know if people know where we get our money from, but RNZ is fully government funded and TVNZ is, of course, a state enterprise. So a little bit, it's pretty hard to really define. It's pretty hard to work out exactly what the source, of, to, to put your finger directly on what the source of this distrust is. So, I mean this declining trust, I guess that's the headline, but another finding is, is that you're actually, we as a, a nation are less interested in the news overall. Have we got tired of it? We're yeah. less interested in other countries. I, I almost found this one more interesting in a way, and, and the figures are more startling. We're world leaders when it comes to not caring about the news. So 69% of respondents say that they sometimes or often actively avoid the news, and Brazil was second in that table with only 54% of people avoiding the news. In Japan, the figure was 14%. Uh, in the UK, 46 The USA, 42 I mean, it, it seems that we really don't like the news here. Also, the proportion of us that are highly interested in the news, uh, 37% compared to 67% in Finland. And again, this is a complex one to explain. I'm sure we don't fully understand it. I, I wonder how much of it is the fallout from our massive collective consumption of news during the heights of the COVID-19 pandemic, whether there's a bit of a hangover there. The, I think there's news fatigue all across the world, but mm. we were sitting around our TVs inside our houses for great lengths of time watching 1pm press conferences and COVID numbers, uh, and that you, there was a little bit of a maybe I should just listen to music after that for a little while. Um, but the respondents actually shared some other reasons. They think that uh, basically it's depressing. Mm. Depressing information, disproportionate amount of negative to positive news is one respondent. And others just said it's negative and divisive and it's really hard to know what to believe anymore. Mm. Yeah, it's not heart warping like a BBC mystery series. <laughs> no, <laughs> I think after COVID, probably people wanted a bit of BBC mystery. <laughs> so what are some of the, the, the issues with the survey that you can see? Yeah, I mean, it's it's just a, it's a tough one. As the survey, one of the survey's authors say, it's, it's a complex subject. It's not easy to really understand. I'm not sure respondents are necessarily making the distinction in their mind between the opinion sections of news outlets and the news sections of news outlets when they're giving their responses. So like an outlet like News Talk ZB, for instance, it has a relatively low trust score, but I wonder how much of that is due to their divisive commentators, which are kind of divisive by design, mm. rather than perceived flaws with the actual news uh, output of that station, which is relatively quality. Mm. So, I mean, if someone asked me, for instance, I don't know if, about you, but if, mm. do you trust the news? Would you say, 
I would say yes. You do. Speaking. You would say yes. Yeah. I, I don't know whether I'd say yes. Would yeah. I say no? But there are quite a few outlets I wouldn't necessarily trust to deliver a reality-based recounting of events. I think, on balance, I'd say yes. But the, yeah. yeah. But but if well, you I suppose that me, depends on who you are listening to as well. What what your preferred news service is, I guess. Exactly. Yeah. So you'd say you know I trust a particular outlet or a particular reporter. Absolutely. Mm. Uh, but that might not be enough to make you say, I trust the news overall. And those distinctions, they are accounted to, for to a certain extent with the trust scores that are issued to various news organisations on an individual basis. But I'm not sure uh, how much I trust the overall figures on trust. <laughs> uh, you know, I I won't say much more about this, though. I, we're going to have a bunch more of it on, on Sunday because Colin will actually interview the study's authors, I think. And he's filling in for Jim Mora. Fantastic. Now, the next topic, RNZ has been at the centre of a political controversy of sorts this week with uh, Justice Minister Kitty Allen apologising over comments she made at her fiancé, Marnie Dunlop's Leaving Do. Yeah, so Kitty Allen spoke up at the Leaving Do of her fiancé, the former Midday Report host, Marnie Dunlop, and it's important to say that, you know, the the fiancé, because she was saying that she was attending in this personal capacity, Uh, but she made some comments about RNZ and she said sorry for potentially creating the perception she was telling RNZ how to manage their staff or company and she's added that that was not her intent and it is certainly not her job. Uh, That's all been reported by various media media outlets. But one thing that's still a bit unclear in the story, and that's what is it that Alan actually said? I wasn't there. I don't know. Uh, RNZ's statement on the matter gives no detail on the actual content of her comments, but just from what I understand, they were basically praising Mani as a broadcaster and criticising RNZ for letting her leave. So what's the issue with saying that at RNZ? Uh, the Cabinet Manual, really. As RNZ's political editor, Jane Patterson, notes, the Cabinet Manual makes it clear ministers must conduct themselves at all at all times in the knowledge that their royal role is a public one and exercise a professional approach and good judgment in their interactions with the public and officials and in all their communications, and this is the important bit, personal and professional. So basically... They're held to a high standard, including in settings where they may uh, understand they're acting in a personal capacity like this one. So given that, it's pretty unwise for a cabinet minister to be raising these sorts of issues, particularly at a state-owned broadcaster where she could be perceived as trying to exert editorial influence. However, having said that, Alan was raising the issue of Māori broadcasting, Māori representation at RNZ, and that is still most definitely a pertinent issue. How so? So it's worth noting that she wasn't, you know, going out on a limb here. She's acting in a pretty long tradition of politicians and broadcasters uh, making similar points in the past, including the current Minister of Broadcasting, Willie Jackson, who had this to say about RNZ back in 2016 when he was still a broadcaster, not a, not a politician at the time. You're more likely to hear a bird before a Māori uh, a presenter. Uh, in 91 years on this uh, station, we've never had one frontline Māori presenter. Now that's true. And uh, RNZ obviously did take that to heart. It adopted a rotaki Māori strategy after that. It created a role for a manager uh, of that strategy and a Māori news director role, which actually Mani Dunlop filled for a while. It's had a... Māori chair for years and Dr Jim Mather. Uh, you know, we have the Tamanu Kori he reporting team that, that now features a morning report and checkpoint. We have shows like Mapuna with Julian Wilcox. You have Nathan Radadi presenting first up and of course Dunlop was presenting Midday Report until recently and I understand that RNZ is looking to hire someone fluent in Te Māori to replace her but that's not to say that things there's not still work to do because, I mean, in 2020, I interviewed RNZ's chief executive, Paul Thompson, about the fact that RNZ has never had a Māori broadcaster as a full-time presenter on any of its five most popular shows. Those are the big ones, uh, you know, Night's Morning Report, uh, Nine to Noon, Afternoons, Checkpoint, these kind of, uh, mm. you know, uh, and that's still the case. Three, three years on, there are still no Māori presenters on shows like that. And... Also, we've seen people like Dunlop leave and also great journalists, Māori journalists like Ta'anua Hurihanganui. Uh, earlier than that, Mihi Forbes left RNZ to work in TV news as well. And I think Māori media figures have been making the point uh, 
that uh, that that is still not that's not improving fast enough. And that was made today. So commentator Shane Tapo said that RNZ does need more Māori broadcasters and journalists. The former broadcaster Scott Campbell he also said that Māori broadcasting needs more champions. So the the headline is absolutely correct. Kirti Allen uh, was. It was not right. It was unwise to be saying these what she said, especially given her role as a cabinet minister. But that's not to say that the content of what she was saying was necessarily wrong or is necessarily that something something that RNZ doesn't need to address. Well, one thing that is no longer a live issue, Sean Plunkett's Twitter account. The broadcast has been permanently suspended from the social media platform. Yeah, that's right. Um, Sean Plunkett's Twitter account was suspended earlier this week and he's since claimed that trans rights advocates have driven him offline. Uh, Now, that's because Plunkett and his media organisation, The Platform, have been vocal supporters of Posey Parker's tour in New Zealand recently. But that does seem... It does seem pretty unlikely that that's the real reason for his ban. Mm. Uh, From what we know, Plunkett's account was suspended for two reasons... That's breaking Twitter's hateful conduct rule and its rules on exposing private info. And uh, the Fulbright scholar, scholar Guled Meyer was one of the people who did report his account. He's posted about this publicly. But he reported him over a tweet where he encouraged people to read the Christchurch Mass Killers Manifesto, which is, of course, a banned document in New Zealand. Uh, Plunkett was also recently criticised by the journalist David Farrier for posting family court documents on Twitter. And the names in those documents were mostly redacted, but they were only redacted with a felt-tip pen, so people were able to put them in Photoshop straight away and figure out the names that were underneath that sort of pretty makeshift redaction. So uh, that embraces and breaches some of the privacy rules at at the family court. And so those two things are far more likely to have been a factor in his permanent suspension than anti-trans views, which, to be honest, are broadly tolerated on Twitter, including from the site's actual owner, Elon Musk. Well, he's off Twitter at the moment, but of course he's still asking questions. He was in the in the press gallery in the press conference the other day, wasn't he? Yeah, that's that's right. So the AAP's press gallery reporter uh, Ben Mackay actually dryly noted that Elon Musk's Twitter has highly higher standards than the New Zealand press gallery, which has admitted Plunkett recently. Uh, the the, the, the press gallery passport has given Plunkett a new platform to raise trans issues, even if Twitter is no longer available for that task. So he appeared in Chris Hipkins' post-cabinet press conference shortly after his Twitter ban to ask this question. How do you and how does this government define a woman? Um, <laughs> I, to be honest, Sean, that's, that, that question's come slightly out of left field for, for me. Um the well biology sex gender um people define themselves people define their own genders keir starmer has said that he believes 99.9 percent of women do not have penises and i know it's a strange thing for him to say but given recent events in new zealand i'd ask again how do you define what a woman is well, as I've, I, I think as I've just indicated, I wasn't expecting that question, so it's not something that I've, um, you know, formulated, pre-formulated an answer on. But um, in terms of gender identity, I think people define their gender identity for themselves. Now, that clip has gone viral around the world, particularly amongst anti-trans activists, and they say, oh, the, the Prime Minister of New Zealand can't define what a woman is. I mean, to me, that's... That's a man carefully <laughs> assessing a journalist's intentions, uh, one that he might have some reason to be wary of, uh, weighing an answer on a topic he probably hasn't thought that much about or thought that he'd have to address at that moment and coming back with an answer on the thing that he wanted to focus on, in that case, I think, gender identity. I mean, uh, I mean, uh, that's been mocked, uh, presumably because people in anti-trans spaces online wanted some version of the answer a man has a penis and a woman doesn't uh as some sort of biological essentialism like that but uh and indeed on the platform plunkett said his original question was going to be something along the lines of can women have penises um however what hipkins actually focused on is the correct answer 
legally, I don't mind a little bit of pausing and thinking, to be honest. If you've got a tricky question, then pause and think and say what you want to say. And I think that what he said was the correct answer legally. In New Zealand, Mm -hmm. uh, we have gender self-ID and people are allowed to define their own gender. Take your time to figure it out and then, yes, give your answer. Yeah, better to, better to not say anything than to say something stupid. Well, that's right. Get you you could say, trouble. The, say the wrong thing so easily. Um, a more positive note now, you wanted to issue a bit of praise uh, to a couple of media organisations who include people who don't always get included in news reports. Yeah, News Hub Nation and Morning Report went, um, well, they, they went out of their way this week to include people who are part of what's often referred to as the working poor in their stories this week. And so News Hub Nation usually starts its program focusing on one of the, the great and good, a senior government minister or an opposition leader. But on Saturday, it took a different tack, interviewing Thomas Mamusia at the top of its show. And he's been in his job for 23 years, and his take-home pay is just over $1,000 a week. But as the New Sub Nation reported, he's paying 10.1 interest on his mortgage, which he got from a secondary lender, and his weekly payments are over $900. So he's basically got $100 to $200 to pay for everything else, and it's not enough to live on. And he's had to accept help from his adult children along with his local Marae. So here he is talking about that. What do you think about the fact you've been working for 23 years in, in one job and you're having to go to the local Marae for food parcels? Well, I was pretty, had to swallow my pride uh, for the first time I did it. But yeah, when I thought about, you know, well, what else can, I, can you do? Now, despite that assistance and despite being, again, in full-time work, he's now on the verge of losing his house. Is there a chance that you could lose the house? Uh, yeah, or well, that's a possibility. There's his phrase, the working poor. Yeah, I was just going to say. <laughs> yeah? That is, that's me, yeah. That's me and probably everyone I know. <laughs> So Hayden, was News Hub, uh, News Hub trying what to illustrate in that interview what the rising cost of living? Yes, uh, pretty much. The this is putting a human face on the rising yeah. cost of living and a human face on the actual impact of stuff like the Reserve Bank raising interest rates, as it did today. So it, it screened. It actually preceded an interview uh, with Finance Minister Grant Robertson. That screened immediately afterwards. And before it even started, Grant Robertson was confronted with uh, Mamoisia's uh, words at the start. And, uh, you know, I think it, it helped frame what could have been a dry political talk about the costs of, uh, well, and benefits of adjusting the OCR. Uh, instead, he had to address a real situation, a real person that was impacted by it. So here's Robertson talking about the possibility of Moisia uh, losing his house. He's likely, or says it's a possibility, he's going to lose his house. Is that a sign of things to come? Well, you know, he again, he's in the secondary lending market. He's paying a mortgage rate significantly higher than what most New Zealanders who own a home are at the moment. Mm. I certainly hope he doesn't lose his home, and I would encourage him to continue to have conversations with mainstream lenders to see if there is a way of him being able to carry through. Yeah, it... it, it... It was a bit of an odd one, actually, you know, because Grant Robertson probably is able to defend these policies more in the abstract, defend things more in the abstract than when he's actually talking about a single person's actual situation. It was an interesting way to frame it. And mm. Morning Report tried a similar technique just a couple of days later. So what did it do? It had an interview with a cleaner, uh, Rose Kavapalu, and uh, I listened to it in the car, and I just found it really gripping and quite emotional. So this is uh, Kavapalu talking about doing the supermarket shopping. And it's so expensive to live nowadays. You know, you go to the supermarket, things are so expensive just for the basics. Yes. It is, it is really emotional. You know, when you go to the supermarket... You know, the essential things that you really need, you know, to, when you have a big family, you have to really look of how much that you have in your hand. Now she went on to tell Guy and Espiner how upsetting it is just to see the cost of petrol going up. It used to be okay, but now the petrol, you know, the, that we have two hours going to that job and that job, 
and it's ridiculous now. Now, I was really struck by this because we don't often or always hear from people on the radio for whom petrol rising in price is a real existential issue that, that are brought to tears by it. We hear economists and politicians talking about it in the abstract. We hear people complaining about it that aren't actually going to lose their livelihoods over it. But but not many people like Kavapalu who struggle to pay, uh, who have to choose between paying for petrol and feeding the families the, their families the basics and sometimes having to choose one or the other. And so it was quite a raw interview and, again, one that informed a subsequent discussion, this one between Espiner and the Reverend Stephen King of the Living Wage Movement immediately mm. afterwards. And that became more personal, having heard from Rose. So like people like Kabapalu and Moisia don't always get equal time in our media, do they? Yeah, that's right. And when we're coming out of COVID, I think you'll remember this. We heard all the time from hospitality owners yeah. and business lobbies and uh, about how they were uh, go short of profits. And we didn't hear all that much from the service workers who didn't want to catch COVID or were being put back to work and didn't want to work in dangerous conditions for low pay. And uh, I think that bias exists partly because these well-resourced lobbies uh, for business and hospitality and all these, not just those two industries, but every industry, they have the time, energy and the resources to make it easy for our reporters. Mm -hmm. They sometimes have industry representatives. Uh, landlords is another one, right? We often hear from the owners of properties mm -hmm. and we don't always hear from the people that might benefit from apartments or the people that might go into social housing, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, there's industry representatives that pay good money just to be on the end of a phone with the quote, ready for you when you, when you know, when a time poor journalist uh, needs to fill up some pixels in the website. And people like Rose Kavapalu or Thomas Mamoisia don't always have as many representatives. And that's why I think it's imperative for the media to go out and find their perspectives and to talk to them and uh, to talk to low paid workers and their unions and the mm. people that will stick up for them. And so I just wanted to say good on Morning Report and News Hub Nation for doing so this week. It is amazing when you think about it, because those two are working as hard as they can work. And yeah. as she rightly points out, living in Auckland, you're driving from job to job, it takes hours, you're running out of gas, and you can't afford to refill. I mean, it's a terrible situation. And it's humanising as well, because we often hear rhetoric about how people are lazy if they're poor, mm. and 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 these are people that are these are people that are working full time and just actually can't afford housing and the basics and. Mm. I think that that's really valuable perspective to include.